So I'm going to talk about great user research for non-researchers. And as a user researcher myself, this is a great topic to be here to talk to you all about. You know, in, in the world of my profession and my community, researchers, we have concerns about what happens when other people go out and work with users. But ultimately, I think what we want to do as a helping profession, as researchers, is we want to empower everyone to do well. And we don't want to be the user research police. And I hope that where you work, that that's what you're finding as well. You know, the demand uh, for research, it exceeds the supply of researchers. And besides that, there's just all these benefits when everyone does research, when research is democratized, as people are starting to call it now. Uh, and a colleague of mine has, become, uh, has begun referring to both researchers and people who do research. And she actually abbreviates that as PWDR. So I think probably that's all of you. Uh, and so the talk today is about trying to level up PWDR. So I'll talk about three areas, planning research, doing research, and acting on research. You know, ultimately, our goal is learning from customers, but I would encourage you to think about that in a very broad sense. You know, go further than, is the product we're making usable, or do people like the thing that we're making? There are many, many more questions that you can ask, and many, many more things that you can learn, and this will inform not only what you're building right now, but actually everything that you do as a business. So. Take some time to identify your business question. That means, what is your challenge? What is your company trying to do? And your research objective, which is different, right? What information will drive the action on that business question? This is before you get to the specific questions that you want to ask of people, that you want to ask from your citizens, your customers, your users. Now, you can start with any one of these three, but you have to flesh out the other two wherever you start and really think about this as something that's, these are interdependent uh, aspects of planning for research. Yeah, I talked with a UX manager uh, who was so frustrated by her organization's very eager approach to what she called test all the things. You know, and for many people, testing seems to be their overarching term for any kind of user research, as well as just a general mindset for how we make things to put out into the world. And testing is a type of user research, but it's not the only one. You know, I mean, as researchers, and I hope for all of you in the work that you do, we're seeking to deeply understand behavior, needs, meaning, desires, not just validate, not just look at the product or just look at the solution. So going out to do research, what are you going to do? There's many methods. You can see in this uh, table from Christian Rohr, uh, and I recommend this if you haven't seen it before. It's this excellent paper which goes on to describe which methods are best for which situations, which has been kind of a holy grail, I think, in the user research world for a long time. Um, and it's not a complete list. We make up new methods all the time. Uh, but keep in mind that there's a framework for considering methods. Uh, and that whatever the best approach is, whatever the best method, well, that's contingent on the business question and the research uh, objective that we described earlier. Yeah, thinking about who we learn from, thinking about who we're going to build for or sell to, you don't need to think of your research as simply looking at the people who are already using your product. You may want to build for someone that is very different from who you learn from. So, for example, speaking with lead users. You may not choose to be building something for lead users, but by learning from them, they actually can illustrate by contrast 
right? It gives you a new perspective on what's the situation for the typical customer. How are they behaving? What do they have to overcome? You may not see it by looking at the typical customer as clearly as when you look at a different kind of user, a different kind of customer. It creates contrast and it reveals these, uh, these sort of implicit aspects of what people are trying to do and solve. So remember that your users are often part of a system uh, there's relationships and interactions outside maybe what you do with them. And even if you aren't selling to the entire system, those other nodes in the system, there are other people, that has an impact on what your user, your customer's needs are, and indeed what success looks like for them as a result of what they do or what you provide to them. So a simple example is research I did uh, last year trying to inform the a new way of delivering surgical uh, technology and equipment into the operating room. So yes, we talked with surgeons who had all these different specialties, but also we talked with the OR administration, uh, scrub techs, first assistant nurses, and the departments that order supplies, the departments that clean supplies, all trying to understand the implications of the changes that my client's new design would bring uh, into the work processes from all these different points of view. Yeah, you know, we, we do a lot of our everyday work over Hangout and Zoom. Uh, we're looking at screens anyway. So sometimes the mindset is like, well, let's just do our research that way. We're, we're sitting in front of the screens. We have this infrastructure. We have these work processes anyway. And it's, it, it is less effort. Uh, it is faster and cheaper, and those things are important. But I just really want to beg you all. You're missing out on so much. You know, you will see things in people's environments that you won't ever see on a computer screen. You will have a rapport with your research participants that you cannot achieve when your interaction is mediated by digital bits streamed through the cloud. And, and you, and this is I think maybe the most important, you will be changed by taking the measured risk of leaving your comfort zone, literally, and going into someone else's space. And if you can't do this, uh, you know, operationally with every person that you, that you try to learn from, at least try to go out and see some users. All right, let's talk now about doing the research. Uh, and thinking about asking questions. Specific questions are better than general questions. So asking someone, how do you choose a contractor, typically? That's a hard question to answer. It presumes that the participant that you're asking this question has a typically, that they've gone through something, they've reflected and they've identified for themselves, here's the set of practices that I, that I go through. And if they don't, you run the risk that they're gonna make up something to kind of fill in, to kind of perform up to the question that you're asking them. You know, instead, it's better to ask about a specific instance. Ask about the last time they started a project, and in that situation, how did they go about selecting a contractor then? And then you can ask, you know, is that part of a pattern? How does that compare and contrast with other times that you've done this? That's much, it makes it much easier for the person to give you a reliable answer that way. Oh yeah, this episode of uh, Malcolm Gladwell's podcast, Broken Record, which is sometimes good and sometimes not, but there's some interesting examples of interviewing in there. He does a couple of really great extensions to this principle about getting specific, it's better than general. Uh, so when he's interviewing people, especially you hear it here, he asks them something and they give him a vague answer like, oh, it doesn't work for me. So then he follow up, follows up to get to a specific, give me a specific example of when this general principle works or doesn't work for you. And then elsewhere in the podcast, uh, the people that he's talking to describe some process that they go through, but they describe it vaguely. But he doesn't let that, let that go. He follows up. He asks them to show him what that looks like. So you know, asking follow-ups to get to specifics is a really important technique when you get general answers to an initial question. Don't put answers in the question. Uh, this is a bad practice that many people default to. So a good question is, what happens to the package when it arrives? But the bad practice, and this is very common, we all do this here, what happens to the package when it arrives? Do you open it or hand it to someone else or... 
And it's, it's very hard to break this, and I think sometimes people don't even feel motivated to stop doing this because the justification might be, well, you know, if it isn't any of those things that I suggested, well, then the person I'm talking to will just simply say, well, actually, it's none of those. It's something else. Well, if you believe that, you underestimate the power you have when doing research because eventually, maybe not the first time, but certainly by the fifth time, the participant in your research is going to reflect back the framework you are giving them because they want to do a good job and you're telling them what it looks like to do a good job. This is very hard as a question asker ourselves. This is very hard to stop doing, but I really encourage you to practice this. You know, the naive approach that people take to building rapport when they're interviewing someone is to think, ah, you can connect with that person by telling them the ways that you're like them. But what that does is it takes the focus away from the participant, brings the focus back to you. So when someone reveals something about themselves that they love, you can hold off on your reaction. I love that too. I do that too. You don't have to do that. What you can do is keep asking them questions. So focusing on them, that's what builds the rapport, not about yourself. Occasionally and calmly, you can reveal your own perspective or your own experience if you want to normalize something that they maybe are hesitant or uncomfortable about. That's a very rare case. That's really the best time to share something about yourself. Maybe this has happened to you. If, if participants that you're doing research with, if they start asking you questions like, will the next version have the search console integrated? Do not answer them. Once you answer those questions, then you become the expert, and it's almost impossible to return to research mode. In research mode, they're the expert, and you're interested and curious. So when you get those questions, and you will, you can use the standard researcher deflection and just turn it around and say, why is that important to you? Or if that feels too confrontational, you can say exactly this. I'm going to act like a researcher and turn it around and ask, why is that important to you? When you are out talking to people, you're going to hear them mispronounce the name of your company. You're going to hear them wish for features that actually do exist. Do not interrupt your interview to explain your product to them. Keep quiet, and it may be hard. Be prepared to, uh, you know, metaphorically sit on your hands when this happens. Uh, otherwise, again, you're making yourself the expert. So at the end, when you're all done with the interview, whatever you're doing with them, you can tell them anything that will help them. Now that we're done, you can change the conversation a little bit. But this is not a chance to evangelize a new feature or encourage them to use your product or tool in the way that you hope they would use it. It's only for something that they need help with. And so be very sensitive and kind of gentle with this. You mentioned you were looking for video tutorials. Would you like me to show you, uh, show you where those are located? Social scientists uh, talk about natural language. Right, the way people in a certain group refer to things. And sometimes the local technology, uh, sorry, the local terminology, uh, especially in technology, it may vary from yours. So as you learn those terms from participants in research, the actual individual that you are speaking with, reflect that language back to them in the way that you word your questions. And, you know, warning, don't try to be cool and kind of introduce shorthand that they aren't using. Um, like the person I worked with who uh, uh, they heard, the, 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 the participant said something to them about National Geographic, and then they asked a question about Nat Geo. That's not what the, the phrase is. Use their language. And what that does is reinforce, again, they are the expert. You are curious about their perspectives. And it can take a while when you're with someone to establish a sense of rapport, right? That, that's comfortable back and forth. And, and it depends on you, depends on that person, it just depends on what's happening that day. Uh, it might take 10 seconds, it might take 10 minutes, it might take 45 minutes. You have to be patient. 
But I want you to remember this visualization, and this is what happens. The interview moves from question, answer, question, answer, to question, story. You kind of want to get to that, but you have to be patient. Just because that person isn't effusive right away and just offering stories for every question that you ask, just give them a chance to get comfortable with you or comfortable with the process that you're uh, you know, doing with them. Um, and also, yourself, don't let your, don't try to, yeah, keep yourself from becoming too uncomfortable if it feels awkward. If their response makes you feel awkward because you feel like they're awkward, it can start to spiral. So just be okay with a little discomfort and keep asking questions. Just stick to the plan. Ask questions, ask follow-up questions, and eventually you're likely to reach this point of question story. You should definitely come with a list of prepared questions. But most of the questions that you ask and the way that you, that you word them, the way that you say them, should be emergent. They come from what the person has said already. So you need to follow up because uh, you, you want to get clarity, you want to get more detail, you want to get to a point where you understand what they're trying to tell you. So when you go back to something from before, tell them, I want to go back to something you said before. When you change topics, tell them that you're changing topics. Say, okay, now we're going to switch gears here, and maybe we can talk about planning out budgets now. So this, again, serves to reinforce that you're paying attention to what they're telling you, and it's important, and you want to know more. You're partnering with them in this conversation, and you're making sure that they're tracking with you where things are headed. This really increases comfort and helps build that rapport. When it comes to showing prototypes, I find a lot of teams default to taking their design process artifacts and, and testing them and missing the opportunity to create new things to show in the field that are not part of what you're planning to build, but are tangible, experiential, visible artifacts that people can play with or react to as a way to provoke a deeper reflection on the underlying issues that you want to understand. So imagine this ridiculous flip phone. You are not going to make this product. But you can use this as an artifact to show someone as a way to have a deeper conversation than you could otherwise ever have about form factor, about losing the device, about interacting with a keypad, and so on. Yeah, this is a, a stealth shot I took on an airplane. The people in front of me had rigged up an iPhone holder using the plastic bag that the blanket was kind of wrapped in. So they, they wrapped it up and made a sling, and they jammed this into the tray table hook. This is a great example of a satisfice. I don't know if that's a word that people have heard before, but if not, you've heard it today. Satisfice is a good enough solution, and it comes from the words satisfy and suffice put together. It's an important concept when doing research. People have a very high tolerance for good enough solutions. And sometimes when we see satisficing in the field, we think, aha, that's an opportunity. And sometimes it is, right? Some aircraft interiors now have clips on the seat back where you can mount your device and, and watch during the flight. No plastic bag required. But sometimes it isn't an opportunity. People will continue to put up with a non-ideal solution. You can think about balancing the costs. What's the cost of tolerating an already existing compromise? And what is the cost, the financial cost, the cognitive cost, the switching cost of adopting a new solution? If the cost is zero, like it's in the seat back already, then sure. If the cost is higher, like it's something the traveler has to learn about, purchase, pack, carry, then maybe this is just fine for them. So you have to think about the behavior change required, not just rolling out new fixes because you can. And those won't get adopted. And the philosophy here is try to look at what you see people doing. Try to think about that as, oh, those are choices they've made. That's something that works well enough for them, as opposed to looking for failure in their behaviors when you see these satisfices. Look at them as successes. And then that reframes better what your opportunity is or isn't. All right, tactically here, make a recording. Mechanically, given how fast people talk and how fast any of you can type or write, you cannot take notes well enough. You need a recording that's complete and an accurate document of what happens in an interview or any session. 
The notes that you take are an important way to process, but they're biased. It's what you heard and interpreted. So yes, take notes as a way to process in real time, jot things down, make marginal notes, quick thoughts, but you still need to make a recording for this complete capture. People get uh, distressed and worrying about bias, their own bias in the practice of user research, and it, it's easy to see why. There are so many of them. You know, my advice is to work on a couple things. Work on hearing your own bias. When you have those moments of being wrong, think about how to reframe that. So uncovering your own judgment is actually something that's joyful, it's freeing, and it's liberating. You go from, I was wrong, to, I am learning. And you want to apply this to any moment in a research session, not just what do they have to say, what feedback are they giving you about your, your product or solution. And of course, this is a skill to develop for our lives in general, to practice being excited uh, when you're wrong about something. Empathy is a word we talk about so much. We've certainly heard about it today, uh, you know, in, in our lives. Uh, in the work that we do, empathy is important. Uh, but for research, it's specifically important because it's how you do the work, right? Understanding the contours of someone else's perspective and experience, especially in terms of how it differs from yours, that's what it takes to do user research. That's really what you're trying to learn in the first place. But being judgmental, which is a very human thing, gets in the way. We all do it. What did you think when you saw that plastic bag as an iPhone holder? What will you think when you see one of your customers, one of your participants, share something like that about what they're doing? So to confront our own judgment, first, learn to hear yourself making those judgments. And then practice questioning your assertions. Maybe that isn't true. If you can, get more data to flesh out a new conclusion. But even if you can't, I think challenging your judgment is a way to open yourself up to the kinds of revelations that we're seeking. So these two emotions, empathy and judgment, are, are tied together. They are in adjacent regions of the brain. I don't have a brain diagram, unfortunately, but there's neuroscience here. Um, and and you know, this, this fact, this enables an amazing life hack for when you are feeling judgmental and angry. And you can do this anytime. It doesn't have to be in user research. Uh, for example, I was traveling recently and I had this long morning walk to go meet my friends and I was late and hurrying and I was just generally feeling grumpy. I know, surprise. Uh, but I went through this park and there's a bunch of people getting off the tour buses and they're crowding around and they're, they're just getting in my way. And I just felt so annoyed and just so critical of these people and I'm kind of walking through and I pass by this three generation family there the mom is posing people to take a picture. And I just happened to make eye contact and gestured that like I could take a picture of all of them. And so wordlessly, they gave me the camera and they posed. And you know, I took a vertical shot and a horizontal shot and I, I handed the camera back to them and they expressed so much gratitude. But the thing here is I felt so much better. Beyond being a good person in the world, yes, of course, that's not the point of my story. My point is that extending empathy is good for us. We feel better. You know, and there's also brain science that tells us that stress limits our, our ability to, to feel and express empathy. So when you're developing uh, work plans for doing user research, make things that are reasonable. Not too many sessions. Make sure you have breaks. Make sure you plan for whatever might stress you out. All the logistics, the technical stuff, driving directions, and so on. All right, so let's talk now about taking action based on the research that we've done. And some people seem to think that once you talk to people, you write up the key takeaways from each person, and you kind of tabulate it in a deck, and you're done. But that really is insufficient to get the full value out of user research. You know, we talk about insights, but insights are not something that you just simply gather. They're the outcomes of a process. So if you want to get beyond the obvious, beyond just collecting a list of the things people told you they wish your product did, you have to go through this process. And it's a combination of analysis and synthesis. So just very briefly, analysis is 
breaking larger pieces down into smaller ones. So pulling anecdotes out of an interview. Synthesis, then, is combining smaller pieces into something larger. So these anecdotes become themes, they become frameworks, they become you know, targeted areas for you to develop and innovate. It can be very time consuming to do this, I don't want to fool you, but the more you put in, the more you get out. Some people plan for two to three hours of analysis and synthesis for every hour that they spend doing research. Here's one approach to analysis, looking at a transcript and, and marking or coding different parts of what your research participants said based on the issues and concerns that those reveal. So you can go person by person and see from each transcript what it is that each person articulates or, or references. That's analysis. Then you can take all those issues that you have identified and put them together into a larger framework. That includes the patterns, but it also includes your concluding point of view about these patterns. That is what synthesis is. A shortcut for doing analysis is to look closely at the meaning of words. So people tell us things in research, and we might assume that they're using the word the same way we are, especially if it's a technical term or a word that we use internally to mean something. So someone talks about reporting. We may take a certain meaning for that, but you can identify a bunch of meanings that might have. Uh, someone talks about a solution. That can mean a lot of things as well. So you can look closely at what they said and what you assumed and using the larger context of the conversation to re-examine what did they mean by that word. Uh, sometimes you feel surprised or confused by someone's description of their own behavior. That's a cue that you can look more closely at what those words mean versus what you think they mean. And you may be clarifying this in the field. If you're good and, ex let's just say experience is a better phrase than good, if you've done this, you start to hear when those words mean different things and you clarify it in the field. But you won't clarify, no one can clarify everything. You're going to realize later on, um, uh, you know, in your synthesis analysis process, you're going to dig into these words uh, to try to get to what is it that the person's really trying to say. Oh, for example, you might, uh, when you hear the phrase power trip, uh, you might have a certain interpretation in mind, but you see this sign, and that reveals a different interpretation of the phrase. There's a lot more in this amazing post by John Kolko. It's essentially a step-by-step -step recipe for analysis and synthesis. It's very detailed about the process. It's interesting. It's not very much at all about the creative activity of trying to pull meaning from what people say and what they don't say, but it's a great resource for the operations of the process that I'm describing. So to make sense of the research, you know, go back to where you started, what you heard from stakeholders, what assumptions they had about what the problem is or what the need is and, and what they think the solution is. Uh, in some situations, and more and more lately, I'm, I'm doing very in-depth with research with stakeholders before I talk to customers and users because that really helps me identify the gap and there's a lot of value in uh, revealing those gaps between how stakeholders frame the need, the solution, the problem, and how your target, your customers, your users talk about it. That gap, being able to articulate that gap is a, is a powerful way to bring value out of the research you're doing. You know, for researchers, a familiar response is to uh, coming out with, uh, here's what we've learned and here's what we you know, have to tell you about it, is a dismissive, oh, we already knew that. And you may hear this pushback when you share what you've discovered, but you have to ask your audience, really, did you? Something being familiar or feeling true is not the same as already knowing it. Uh, and recognition is not recall. And beyond that, confirmatory findings are okay. There's a lot of reasons why research results get rejected. And you know, one is the discomfort that comes from having to change your mind. At, at best, it's inconvenient. Um, you know, a few years ago, a client asked us to look at the ways that people were using certain personal technology products, and they had already categorized, uh, uh, they developed this hypothesis around different categories of usage that the behaviors were going to fall in. But when we reported back that the most crucial areas of behavior were things that we didn't know about going in, that were outside those categories, that we discovered, they got very quiet. And they told us, well, 
we've already assigned teams and considerable resources to doing development around the categories that we've already started out with. And in fact, they were willing to develop where the opportunity was, but we failed to tell them that we learned about their categories and there were other areas that were more fruitful. So when we said it that way, they were able to let go of the plans that they had already made and, and focus on where the research pointed them. But it took me realizing sort of how to deliver this information so that it was confirmatory and it pointed the way forward. That's uh, what I have time for today, uh, but I'll leave you with three follow-up resources if you want to do more with research. Uh, the first is a podcast called Dollars to Donuts. This is uh, uh, an interview series I do with people who are leading and building in-house research practices, which is not, uh, there was no leadership in research or very rare a number of years ago, and more and more this is something that is being uh, built up and led, and, and you know, I talk to people from all over the world who are running practices. Uh, interviewing Users is a book about about interviewing users. Um, you can buy it at that link, but there's also a lot of resources and templates and stuff that you can uh, use in your own work. Doorbells, Danger, and Dead Batteries is or was for sale at the productized booth uh, here. It's, um, it's a book of 65 stories from researchers around the world, talks about what happens to them when they leave their world and they go out into the world their customers are uh, in stories that are sad and funny and challenging and surprising, and what do we learn about the practice of user research from these kinds of stories? So if any of that is helpful for you, I encourage you to check it out, uh, and here's me to keep in touch. Thanks very much for today and uh, for listening, and uh, I'll speak to everybody later. Thank you. Thank you.